So when an injury happens in the endothelium, the vascular system needs to take some action in order to lower and limit the bleeding. Hemostasis is the collection of these actions. Hemostasis comes from Greek. It consists of heme, meaning blood, and stasis, which means to halt or to stop. So together, they mean to stop the bleeding. Hemostasis is a well-orchestrated, precise process involving platelets, clotting factors, and endothelium. It occurs at the site of injury and ends up in the formation of a blood clot to prevent the extent of bleeding. It has four stages. Firstly, arterial or vasoconstriction to lower the blood flow to the site of injury by narrowing the vessel. Then we have primary hemostasis, which involves aggregation of platelets to form a plug at the site of injury. The third step is called secondary hemostasis. The platelet aggregation of the second step is not enough to stop the bleeding, and we need fibrin strands to sew the plug together and make it stronger. The fourth step is contraction of fibrin strands and platelets, forming a solid permanent plug. So the major idea here is that First, when an injury happens, the first reaction is vasoconstriction to narrow the lumen of the blood vessel so that less blood flow would come to the site of injury and therefore we would have less bleeding. Then what happens is that the platelets get activated, they increase their surface area and they just aggregate at the side of the injury in order to form a plug so as to block the way of bleeding so as to stop the bleeding and that would be our second step or primary hemostasis the formation of a platelet plug but then this is not enough because these platelets are not solid enough and we have to do something else. What happens is that we need fibrin strands so as to somehow saw these platelets together, just uh, go around them and uh, adhere all these components together. But the problem is that we don't have circulating fibrin in the blood. Instead, we have fibrinogen, which is a precursor of fibrin. So fibrinogen has to be converted into fibrin first, and then fibrin monomers have to come together so as to form a polymerized fibrin strand, and then fibrin strand can attach to the platelets and form fibrin meshwork, and that would be secondary hemostasis practically. And eventually, these fibrin strands and the aggregation of platelets would contract so as to even furthermore uh, um, consolidate the plug that we already have there. And of course, in the fourth step, one more thing that we do is to limit the coagulation and to limit the clot formation so that we wouldn't have, we wouldn't stop the blood and we wouldn't stop the blood flow by forming too big of a clot. So let's take a look at these steps in more details. So the first step was arterial or vasoconstriction. So this step happens immediately after the injury to reduce the blood flow and therefore to prevent bleeding. The, the problem is that it only has a transient effect and the bleeding would resume if other actions aren't taken. So uh, another thing to know about it is that it is mediated by reflex neurogenic mechanisms and also by local factors such as endothelin, which is a potent vasoconstrictor. So the second step was primary hemostasis or the formation of the platelet plug. So, a uh, disruption of the endothelium exposes subendothelial factors that lie right beneath the en endothelium. These include von Willebrand factor as well as collagen. What do they do? They promote platelet adherence and activation. So, platelets change their shape in this step from discs to flat plates with spiky protrusions. This increases their surface area. Platelets also secrete their granules, so these granules contain chemicals that promote recruitment of even more platelets. 
leading to the aggregation of platelets to form the primary platelet plug. So let's move on. In the third step, we have secondary hemostasis or deposition of fibrin. This step involves production of tissue factor at the site of the injury. So tissue factor is a membrane-bound procoagulant glycoprotein which is expressed by subendothelial cells such as smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts in the vessel wall. It binds and activates factor 7, which activates a cascade ending up in thrombin generation. This cascade is called coagulation cascade. Thrombin cleaves circulating fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin, creating a fibrin meshwork. It is also an activator of platelets, leading to additional platelet aggregation. The fourth step is clot stabilization and resorption. During this step, polymerized fibrin and platelet aggregation undergoes contraction, forming a solid permanent plug that prevents further hemorrhage. Factors that limit the clotting to the site of injury are activated, notably tissue plasminogen activator or TPA, which is involved in fibrinolysis. They eventually lead to clot resorption and tissue repair. So, so far you have an overview of hemostasis. Now let's dive into details regarding major components in this process. Namely, we are going to discuss platelets, coagulation cascade, tests and lab assays used to assess coagulation, the important role of thrombin and the role of endothelium itself. I suggest that you watch the entire video to gain a deep, thorough understanding of this concept. Otherwise, you can jump to where you want by clicking on the times in the description. So let's start with platelets. Platelets are disc-shaped enucleate cell fragments that are derived from megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. They have two types of granules inside of them. They have alpha granules and they have dense or delta granules. So alpha granules have P-selectin on their membrane. So P-selectin is an adhesion molecule, that's something to remember. But they also have two sets of proteins. Firstly, they have proteins that are involved in coagulation, but they also have proteins that are involved in wound healing. The proteins that are involved in coagulations would be fibrinogen, coagulation factor 5, and von Willebrand factor. And the proteins that are involved in, in wound healing would include fibronectin, platelet factor 4, which is a heparin binding chemokine. They have platelet derived growth factor, or PDGF, and they also have transforming growth factor, beta. Let's move on to the dense or delta granules. In the delta granules, we have adenosine diphosphate or ADP, we have adenosine triphosphate or ATP, and we have ionized calcium, serotonin, and epinephrine. The function of these proteins that are in the dense granules are also mostly related to a coagulation cascade, but we'll get to that later. So let's move on. After a vascular injury, the subendothelial components such as von Willebrand factor and collagen are exposed because the endothelium has been injured and therefore the subendothelium is now exposed to the inside of the vessel lumen. So once platelets that are traveling in the blood encounter them and they encounter these factors, what happens is that they undergo some changes. So these changes can be divided into the following four categories. Firstly, platelet adhesion, then the rapid change of the platelet's shape, then the secretion of their granules contents, and platelet aggregation. So platelet adhesion, what is it and how is it done? So platelets have to fill in the site of injury and adhere to that place in order to fill it up. 
This process is mediated by von Willebrand factor. Von Willebrand factor mediates the adhesion of platelet surface receptor glycoprotein IB or GPIB to the collagen. So collagen is a subendothelial component that is exposed after the injury. So von Willebrand factor actually helps the adhesion of platelets to the collagen. Now what happens if one of these two components that are important Important in the adhesion of platelets to the collagen is missing, for example, due to a genetic deficiency. So genetic deficiency of glycoprotein IB would cause a disease called bernard soulier syndrome. Also, the genetic deficiency of von Willebrand factor would cause another disease that is called von Willebrand disease. Both of these diseases are bleeding disorders because if you cannot form a proper platelet plug, you cannot stop the bleeding. The next one is the rapid change of shape of platelets. So circulating platelets are normally in the shape of discs, but in this case, they change their shape to plates with spikes, so they would be similar to a sea urchin. Platelets change their shape in order to prepare themselves for the coagulation process. In the coagulation process, the platelets are supposed to bind to fibrinogen, so they need to increase their affinity for these molecules. They do this by making some alterations in some of their surface glycoprotein structures, for example, glycoprotein IIB, as well as glycoprotein IIIA. One more change that platelets do is that they translocate their negatively charged phospholipids, particularly phosphatidylserine, to their surface. So uh, platelets are going to provide a surface, a platform, for the coagulation cascade to happen. And coagulation cascade requires a negatively charged surface in order to happen. And that is something that is provided by platelets. These negatively charged phospholipids bind calcium, providing a nucleation point for the assembly of the coagulation cascade proteins. The next one is secretion of platelets granules contents. This one is triggered via a signaling pathway through a special type of G-protein coupled receptor that is called PAR or protease activated receptor. So a protein activated receptor is switched on by a proteolytic cleavage that is carried out by thrombin. So what happens is that the presence of thrombin would activate PAR and therefore PAR would be present and activated on the surface of platelet to carry out the signaling pathway that is necessary for the secretion of the content of granules. Another important molecule involved in this process is ADP which is present in in dense granules, as we said before, the release of ADP would trigger additional platelet activation and would activate a process called recruitment, recruitment of platelets. After change of shape and secretion of granules, our platelets are considered to be activated. Activated platelets also produce thrombexane A2 or TXA2, which is an inducer of platelet aggregation. Uh, so aspirin inhibits platelet aggregation by inhibiting cyclooxygenase, a platelet enzyme that is required for the synthesis of thromboxane A2. The next one is platelet aggregation. So we already said that we have transformed glycoprotein IIB and IIIA. So these transferred glycoproteins allow the binding of fibrinogen to platelets as well as platelets to each other, leading to an aggregation of platelets at the site of injury. What happens if we have a genetic deficiency of glycoprotein IIB, IIIA? That would cause a bleeding disorder called Glanzmann thrombastenia. 
So initially, the aggregation is reversible, but once it consolidates by platelet contraction, it becomes irreversible because the plug turns into a solid block that is not possible to change it. So thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin, which is insoluble, creating the definitive secondary hemostatic plug. Also, leukocytes and red cells can get trapped inside of the plug due to the leukocytes that bind to P-selectin on the platelets. Okay, so this is the end of the first video on hemostasis. Click right up here in order to move on to the second video to continue learning about it. We are going to talk about coagulation cascade, tests and lab assays, thrombin and endothelium in the second video. Thank you very much for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If you want, you can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. Don't forget to take a look at synapse.org.